All right. Welcome back, everyone. So today we are talking about motivation when you are on your health journey, because we all know, myself included, that if you're looking, if you're trying to lose weight, maybe you've got a health goal, you're trying to cure a chronic issue, illness, whatever it is, that you run into some stumbling blocks along the way, to say the least. I know with some things in my life, I'm still working on, like, 10 years later, I'm still trying to figure things out. And you get discouraged. And so today we're going to be talking to a man that lost 130 pounds in one year. And he is such an inspiration and has now taken this you know, newfound f- love for fitness and health and nutrition and is now spreading the word to others with his podcast and his coaching business. It is Daryl McTogg. Welcome, Daryl. Hey, how's it going? Great. Um, it, and who's the turtle? Introduce everyone to the turtle in the back. So <laughs> that would be Mo. She's going to live longer than I am. <laughs> now, come on now. I don't I'll think be, so. <laughs> forever, seriously. I got her my senior year of high school in 06. What? Yeah. No, you didn't. Yeah. Holy, that's crazy. So maybe it will. Okay. I believe you. It might just outlast you then. <laughs> so Daryl, you do not, looking at you, and for those that are listening and not able to hear, this is on video cast, so you can check it out on the YouTube channel. But Daryl does not look like someone that was 130 pounds heavier than he is right now. So take us back five, six years ago now, August 2012 to be exact, when you decided enough was enough what was going on so i i mean it's the same story that i hear so many people that come into my gym tell and that i talk to all the time for pretty much my whole life i had always been a big guy i don't remember a time like maybe when i was really small child in like elementary school when i wasn't big um so that was just kind of my reality. I had, I had tried and failed to lose weight and do something about it several times. I actually had one somewhat successful go at it. Senior year of high school, I lost 70 pounds doing Weight Watchers, and I was playing football and trying to do sports. But by the time I got out of college, I had gained it all back and more and hit my heaviest at 305. So that was, it was just that was my reality, and I had by the time – that massive regain happened and I hit my peak weight, I had just kind of accepted it. I mean, the attempts to go to the gym in college had totally flopped. It was so much easier to just not care about it and eat what I wanted and play video games and be lazy and spend my time doing other things. So that was that. And then I had, uh, I was a year out of college. I had a a theater degree, uh, focus in audio. I was a sound designer and audio engineer. And I was back at my old summer gig at a local casual dining chain restaurant, uh, waiting tables, bartending. I worked as a shift supervisor, training, and I was on management track. So I had the artistic side of my resume covered from internships at you know, Berkshire Theater Festival and Opera, New Jersey. And so I figured it'll be good to get the management side of things so that I can go be an audio supervisor somewhere or something like that. And when you're working in a restaurant, you are surrounded by food, obviously. So the opportunity is always there. And whenever we would have a send back, like, oh, these were supposed to be buffalo tenders, but they're honey barbecue. They went back to the break room guess I don't have to pay for dinner tonight. Cool. So I would just eat whatever came back. And that was part of how I hit my peak. And you wear, we had to wear black work pants. And this is, this is what did it. Every few months, I would, when you're big, your legs rub together. Every few months, I'd wear through the inner thigh of my work pants. And there, there would like, literally, there would be a hole like bare thread and holes in the pants. And I'd have to go buy a couple of new pairs of pants. They were cheap enough, but I had to go to Walmart because it's the only place that had pants big enough. And when you got to go over a 
42 waste, they cost a few bucks more because of how much material they take to make, wow. which was rubbing salt in the wound. And that happened every few months. So this wasn't just once or twice I had to deal. It was every few months. And eventually I got so tired of that that I thought, I'm smart. I'm going to go get Dickies because they're extra tough and they won't wear through. They, they were seriously like heavy duty. Like I remember Dickies. Yeah. Yeah. They're heavy duty, right? Yes. Very. They took an extra month or two and they wore through too. And when those ones wore through, something just snapped. Like I, I just, I couldn't, I could not, like I saw it starting and I was like, no, that's just lint. And then I saw it really starting to wear. And I just, when it actually happened, I couldn't believe it. I just, I was done. Like there's no good way to describe that feeling when you're just, you're at the end of your rope. You have, you are just, that's it. Something has to change, period. There wasn't even an or else. It was just like, Mm. there was no option. There was no possibility of an or else. Like, this is happening. It has to. And that was when I started. And so when you look back on that now, how different did you feel internally? Like, what was going on the inside as far as energy and, you know, depression or anything like that going on? Like, where was your headspace when you're at 300 pounds before or after that last point (laughs) just before (laughs) i mean just before it was the same as it had always been i was just living life that was my reality and nothing was out of the norm and i was just cruising along i mean i i didn't really know any other way so i didn't necessarily feel low energy because maybe at that point i didn't really know what high energy was supposed to feel like. I didn't recognize feeling bad and I don't remember feeling bad or sluggish or bleh because maybe at that point I didn't have a good to reference it against. Yeah, to compare it to really, right? You had nothing to compare it to at that time because like you said, you'd been suffering since you were young. So looking back on it, you know, comparing it to how you feel now then must be pretty big difference oh so yeah well between now and then is complete night and day like i just i feel good like i'm not sluggish i'm not not tired i don't get winded going up the stairs it's totally different i remember talking to one client who said she didn't realize how heavy she was and she was over 300 pounds as well until her son took a picture of her from behind and she was sitting at her computer desk and she was spilling over the chair in the picture, obviously. And that was the first time that she was like, oh, I better do something about this. And that was her kind of breaking point was that. So it's kind of interesting how some people don't, it just becomes their norm. Like you said, it becomes your norm. And now you've come this far and you can look back and be like, Holy, was that not normal? <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be really tough to recognize when you're living in it and it's just like, you know, status quo, everything's good. <laughs> Except I'm having to buy new pounds every month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So take us from there then. What, I mean, looking ahead and going, holy, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm 300 pounds. You're looking at this road ahead of you, which so many people have. And it's daunting. It's huge. It's and it's scary. So what what did you do to start propelling yourself forward from there? I well, having that realization that something has to change was a big deal, and that was really all I was going off of. And if, like everybody always says, if I knew then what I know now, boy, would that have gone differently. But you know, I didn't know. I didn't have a, a specific goal. I didn't have a hard and fast plan that was getting me anywhere. I didn't, I knew nothing. I was that, I, like I told you, I had like barely worked out. All I knew about working out was the bigger, faster, stronger 12 week thing, the big 
ridiculous index card looking thing that we had from the football team in high school. And it was your traditional, you know, bodybuilding style, chest day, back day, whatever. And when you finish the 12 weeks, you start a new card. So that was all I knew about fitness. So I, what ended up happening after that little episode at the restaurant and at home, I took a minute and I don't remember if it was that night or the next day, but I talked to my girlfriend who is now my wife and said, I basically, I don't even remember exactly what I said, but I basically explained to her what had happened, where I was at. I have to do something. I'm doing something. Do you want to do it with me? Because she was in a similar boat. I don't, you know, we've never really talked too deeply about her whole backstory on it, but she was big at the time too. And so she was willing to do it with me and go right alongside me. Um, I, I got to tell you, I don't actually know exactly what weight I was at my very, very peak uh, because as one who did not generally care very much, I didn't actually step on a scale. I just, I, you know, every once in a while I would just out of curiosity. And the last time I remember doing it was 305 and change. It could have been a little bit higher by the time I actually started. Um, but we ended up pulling the trigger and borrowed some workout DVDs from a friend. And because at the time I was fresh out of college, student loans, not making a buttload of money. And I was dirt cheap. So, Hey, borrow those DVDs and let's do something. And we, we did it all right. And it was, I mean, all I had was this three month thing and it had a calendar. So, okay. I have a thing to do each day. It's going to get me to the end of the 90 days and let's see what happens. And I tried and to follow the nutrition thing that came with it, which wasn't really the best plan in retrospect, but you know, it was better than what I was doing. Yeah. Cause you lost, you just told me before we started that you lost 130 pounds in one year. So it must've like, can I borrow those DVDs and start giving them out to clients? <laughs> Well, here's the thing, anything you, and I still say this today, anything is better than nothing. Anything mm -hmm. that you're doing is going to do something. There are just better, more effective ways. Like, honestly, I think the biggest thing that I did there wasn't the work. I mean, yeah, getting physically active was important and it's why I didn't just become skinny fat. You know, I had some muscle to me. The biggest thing was the nutrition. I stopped eating the garbage at the restaurant. I stopped drinking soda, completely cold turkey. And today with my coaching, I kind of encourage people to like make small sustainable changes that you can like actually live with forever. <laughs> Not exactly what I did in the beginning, but I completely changed how I ate. I started changing my relationship with food and eating good food and eating reasonable amounts of food. And really, I think that was what had, had the, the lion's share of the role in that big weight loss. Had I sought out a coach and had a little bit more structure and a plan that was actually meant for me specifically, I might have been able to lose more faster. Not that we're complaining that you lost 130 no. pounds, right, Daryl? <laughs> Definitely not complaining. It, I guess what I'm saying is it didn't have to be so hard. Because it was, it was really difficult. I mean, any year long intensive journey like that is going to be challenging. I mean, there were plenty of days where I didn't want to get out of bed and do it. It's hard. It's work. I'm lazy. I don't, I don't want to. But I'll tell you what really helped was the fact that Megan was doing it with me. Because yeah. I knew what happens if I don't. And she's standing there in the living room on her, room on her own. Oh, she's probably not going to do it either. I don't want that on me. I really should just do it. And I got out of bed. And threw on the DVD. <laughs> yeah, which only lasted so long. I went, and you know, I went through a surprising number of those silly workout programs 
I, I think we went through like five of them before we really started like running out of steam. And then I kind of like limped my way through two more, but the, the fire wasn't there the same way. But at that point, most of the weight had been lost. And at that point, I started kind of figuring out my own thing. And really, I started educating myself a little bit more on how to work out and how to achieve different goals and, and kind of how it all, I was, I was that, like, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express and now I knew what to do with fitness. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, I... I can appreciate that a lot with the partner thing too, just what you had to say there about Megan joining you. I think that's a real issue for a lot of women that I work with when they're trying to lose weight and, you know, their husband's not on board or their kids eat a different way and it's so hard for them to eat healthy when everybody else around them isn't. And so I think that that's a really good tip for some people is to, is to try and get your family on board because man, does it make it so much easier. <sighs> you, you've got to have a support system around you. It's incredibly difficult to do something like this alone because there's going to be those low points and those, you could almost call it a dark moment where you just, you're, you're feeling beaten down and defeated and you don't want to do it. And it doesn't take much for that to continue the downward fall into just stopping. Because once you skip the first day, the second one becomes so much easier to stop. You've, you've got to have people on your team. You've got to have the support from family, from friends. Even if they're not doing it with you, at the very least, they can be your cheerleader and, and pick you up and you know, support you in the efforts. If you have no help, then you're on an island. And worse, sometimes I hear from people who their friends and family are totally discouraging them. Yeah, I've got that too, where people are like, look down on them because they, you know, oh, what, you're gluten-free? Oh, or whatever it is, or you're keto, or you're paleo. Or do they just make fun of whatever they're doing when really people just need to be encouraging because it's healthy eating. It doesn't matter what you're following, really. Most of it's still healthy food. It doesn't matter what diet you're following. Yep. Yeah. So in, when you're in those depths and you were hitting those walls of, I don't want to get out of bed or I don't want to do the exercise and I don't want to eat right. What, what else besides Megan and that partnership kept you going during this time and, and up until now, even what's made it so that you didn't fall back and you didn't start eating in your old habits again? Well, there's two different parts to that because the, the now it's definitely a little bit different than what it was then. Then, up until I hit that point where I got down to like 170, 175, I, I hadn't reached it yet. I was still going and I just, I had to keep plowing forward. Like when I had those down moments, I was like, I have to, I can't go back. I can't risk falling back where I was I was deathly afraid of regaining weight. Like I just, I couldn't even bear the thought because if I regained some, that could mean that I was going to backslide all the way there. And so I just, I had to keep plodding forward. There was no, uh, there just, there, there was no option. There was no thought of an option. Today, things are different. It's funny. Um, I got married August, 2012 or uh, 2014 rather. So two years after the fitness journey started two weeks before the wedding, of course, life was really freaking busy. And <laughs> we, that was when we actually faltered a little bit in our fitness efforts. You know, I went from running, I think I ran 35 road races and obstacle races that year in total. A lot of them were five Ks, which is still a thing, but you know, I ran like 35 freaking races that year. And to go from that, and 33 of them happened, I think, before the wedding. So to go from that to, you know, we totally fell off in the two weeks before the wedding because life is psycho. And then the honeymoon happened a week after the wedding because our, we got married on a Friday. Uh, we had Saturday off. And then Sunday was the Falmouth Road Race. And, well, 
we had to run Falmouth because not everybody gets in and it's a big deal. So we said, eh, we'll delay the honeymoon a week and we'll take a day off and we'll have some breathing room and then we'll go on the honeymoon. So there, it, it was all the way up until September. It, I just like was totally not making it happen, not getting it done. I still had a pretty good base fitness level, but like my regular workouts weren't happening anymore. And late in September, I ran the, um, the Spartan beast at Mount Killington. It's their like half marathon distance obstacle course race up and down Mount Killington four times. It was brutal. It took me like 10 hours oh and I ended on, I was not well trained and I ended up right at the finish line. The, the very last obstacle is a fire jump. You jump over this row of burning logs and it's a great photo op and it's a thing. And I was so exhausted, I landed funny, and I cracked my uh, left tibial plateau. And so that knocked me out for all the way until Thanksgiving. So that was another two months that I was out of commission, period. And I remember my first day that I, and not only like not working out, I was like, bedridden practically like because I, I had a stabilizer on my leg I couldn't bend my knees so I couldn't do anything and so you got to figure I went all the way from beginning of August to Thanksgiving pretty much not working out at all after two solid years of being on top of it it was that had a really big effect like all the way up until today it totally threw me off of my routine and it got really difficult to get back into it because by the time I was healed and I could, I ran a turkey trot the day before or the day of Thanksgiving. Like it was my first race back. I took it really easy, obviously, but I, I did a 5K the day I could get back into it. But then it was winter and there's like no races during winter hardly. And I didn't want to risk getting injured again outdoors running on ice and snow because I live in Massachusetts. So it was really all the way up until the spring thaw when I could get out there and do anything really active. So now you got to figure it was all the way from August to March, April. Yeah, that totally threw me off. And it's been really, ever since I've had some difficulties with getting really solidly into a rhythm, which is ironic because I work in the fitness industry. <laughs> And I was at the time when this all happened, I was managing an anytime fitness uh, that I had just gotten into. So it's, it's similar, but it's different to how it was back in the beginning because I still, you know, fat Daryl still lives deep down inside the, the dark recesses of my belly. <laughs> and every once in a while at a restaurant, he, he comes clawing out, but you know, it, it's a different kind of struggle because now I'm just experiencing that, like trying to get into a routine, falling off of it every now and then picking yourself back up, getting back into good habits right now. I'm, I'm in a real solid upswing, <laughs> which is convenient because of what's coming up in October. So, But Daryl, don't you think that maybe that happened for a reason? I think it did. Like listening to that whole story, what I got was, you were on a serious mission. You thought that running was the one thing probably that was really keeping that weight off and that really transformed your body. And it was like life had to say, hey, and kick you out from under your feet and be like, actually, it's not. You've got this. And it's not that you, have, you, didn't, you don't need to run that much. Do you maybe think that? Come on, everything happens for a reason. And I definitely believe that. And I think you're kind of on base there. Yes. It, the, the running happened after I had lost, I, I didn't do my first 5k until I was like down to 240, I think. Um, and so running became a part of what I was doing. But that year, that year where it happened, I did run a lot because I wanted to really capitalize on where I was and see what I could do and just go run everything because it was fun. And I was really getting into it and Yes, it was probably definitely overboard. <laughs> so maybe that was the universe trying to like check me and say, whoa, whoa, mm -hmm. pump the brakes, get your head on straight, be reasonable about this. And of course, the universe says be reasonable. And what do I do? 
I discover very, very long distance running. Because <laughs> if I'm not going to run 35 races in a year, I'll run 35 races all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the ultra marathons, isn't it? Yep. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm <And> smart. So <laughs> Well, and I'm sure part of all of this is it keeps you going. You've, you've got the goal in front of you and it keeps your head in the game. It definitely does. And it, it helps me see that I can still do these things. And it's really ultra marathons are a whole different game. Like once I could get back into running, I, I had worked my way up. You know, I, I was that year where I broke my knee in 2014, I had run like, six half marathons. I was really into it and I had no designs on running a marathon. And after I had healed, May 2015, I ran my first marathon. And that was what I spent, like after being dormant all fall and winter, I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I think I can do it. And I spent the whole spring, not running a million races, but training for a marathon. And then it was miserable in the last 10K because I didn't really understand how to run a marathon and I gassed myself early. But I wanted to try it again and I registered for an October one. And once I finished that, right around Thanksgiving, you know, because going farther, I was able to see, it was really about seeing how far I could go. That was why I did the marathon. And after the second one, okay, I can do a marathon. And I did better at, I, I think I might've done a little bit better at that second one. So I said, huh, what comes after that? I, I was uh, working as a race timer um, for a race timing company up here. Basically the, you wear your number during a race and you run over those mats. It's RFID chip timing. So I did that at races. So because I was in that little world, I was aware of ultra marathons that there was such a thing that was longer than a marathon and one of the races that w we timed several of them and so i said what if i tried a 50k oh my god can i do a 50k and it was this big like this big thing and i finally said to my wife screw it i'm gonna do it <laughs> and i registered and i was like peeing my pants and i just <laughs> registered for this 50k <laughs> And as I was researching how to train for it, pretty much everything I found that would have had me trained up for a 50K in time by Memorial Day weekend would have had me ready for a 50 mile. And this is my thing. I thought to myself, and this is another part of what kept me going in the initial fitness journey, this thought of, well, I'll have already gone 30 miles. I might as well keep going. If I'm going to run, how often am I going to go that far? Marta here, I might as well just keep going. Then that was a thought that had crossed my mind in the midst of that fitness journey. I've already lost 70 pounds. What am I going to stop now? Right. And yeah. so that was how I ran my first ultra marathon. 53 miler. Like you, you should be very proud of yourself to say the least. Do you still, I know you said that, that the, the fat guy still lives down deep down inside but can you look in the mirror now and know that this is now who you are? Do you identify with this now? I do. It's, it's really important to remember where you came from, but that's only something that you should use to help you keep perspective. You need to be able to accept where you are and remember where you're going and what you're working towards, not keep living in the past. It, you got to know it. You got to understand it and not forget where you came from because you can get complacent. But yeah, I, I totally identify and live in the here and now that I am pretty fit. Lazy and out of shape for me is not what lazy and out of shape used to be for me. And I know that Fat Daryl would kill to be where I am now when I'm feeling really down on myself. Yes, exactly. And now you are actually coaching others. So can you talk a little bit about what services that if somebody wants to reach out to you, what are they looking at doing and what do you coach them on? Yeah. So after long enough being uh, a few years, actually being a manager of 
the Anytime Fitnesses that I was working at, I got really tired of the administrative aspect of things and having the whole club on my shoulders. And so I thought, you know what? I want to get into training. I don't want to just be the gatekeeper. I want to be down there swinging the sword in the trenches with these people that are trying to do what I did. Isn't that why I got into the fitness industry in the first place? So I became a certified personal trainer. And so I do, I like to think that I do it a little bit better than like what some people do in personal training where they get their cert and they do the bare minimum. They're just building workouts and okay, do three sets of 10. Okay, you're good. You know, it, it really should be more than that. It, it's health and fitness coaching. It needs to be the complete picture. So you really need to get to know people. You need to understand them, their life, what their goal is, and why the goal is important to them, why they need to get there. If you, I, I firmly believe if you don't have a strong, powerful why, you're not going to get there, no matter how good the goal is. You're just, you're going to have those rough patches and there's not going to be a thing there that propels you forward and keeps you moving. So a big part of my job is getting to know these people that might work with me, understanding them and finding their why and helping them figure out what it is too, because we don't all always necessarily know or acknowledge what it is. And so once I've got a handle on that, you know, make sure that I do a movement screening, make sure I know how you move and everything. And I, build a program. And a program is not just a workout. It's workouts that are meant to help get them where they're going to be. It's checking on your progress every month. It's trying to guide you in the right direction with nutrition as far as I can within my scope of practice. And it's being their biggest cheerleader. It's being their, you know, battle buddy in the trenches. It's being whatever it is that they need you to be to get through whatever they're getting through right now and to get out the other side of their fitness journey successfully. I've done time management work with people and, you know, I call it time rediscovery because all the, I work at a 24 hour gym and people try to tell me they don't have time. Like somewhere in the 24 hours of a day, you've got 30 minutes to get in here and work out. All you need is 30, 45. Like that's, that's all you need. So I help people, find time. I help coach them through whatever bad habits they're trying to kick. You know, it, sometimes I've literally spent an entire session just talking it out with somebody with the stuff that's really going on. Cause when you're a trainer, you're also part therapist and oh yeah, it's really got to be that complete picture. And I'm working on my uh, health coach certification now so that I can really bring more of that complete picture and get a better understanding of other methods and strategies to help people work through this stuff because it really needs to be the whole thing. I totally agree. I mean, I find the same thing in my own practice that a lot of time we people will come in to talk about, you know, losing weight or their nutrition and the entire session is about their husband and their children and their job and all these things that really impact a person's ability to stay on track and eat well and, you know, exercise, all those life things is usually what is stopping you. It's not so much finding the right exercise or finding the right eating, you know, diet. Sometimes it is, but a lot of the time it's what is stopping you from eating well and working out? It's that simple. Yeah. The, the people that I see, life is a major factor. That's why I spend so much time getting to know them. It's, it's all those little things. It's, well, when you're cooking dinner, what about the wife? What about the kids? When you're going out with friends, do the friends support you? Do they take you out to eat a lot? Do you get like, what are you doing? What, how often are you ferrying the kids to work and your schedule just, it all gets in the way and it can seem so overwhelming when you can't parse it out and figure it all out. Yeah. And I really liked what you said too, going back to, you didn't give yourself an option. And I think that that's super key. I think when we see that there's an option in front of us, you know, like eat the cake, don't eat the cake. We usually tend to go with, Oh God, I got to eat the cake. Right. Or whatever it is, or exercise or go, do I lay on the couch? Hmm. Most of the time we'll go lay on the couch, right? If we're giving ourselves the choice and it's figuring out the why, like you said, 
and then saying to yourself, there is no choice, right? I tell myself that about cooking dinner. Like when I just like, oh God, it'd be so much easier just to go pick something up. And I'll be like, I'm not even gonna give myself that choice. There's no choice. I have to go home and I have to cook a good meal for my family, period. Yeah, we, we always tend to go with the path of least resistance. Exactly, and yeah. that's going to be whatever the habit is. It's just easiest to roll with the habit and what's comfortable. Yeah, path, path, path of least out. resistance, but also the path of biggest reward as far as, yes. you know, like which one's going to make you, like with, is the cake going to make you feel good for, for a second? Probably a lot better than that carrot over there or whatever it is, right? You're going to get a, a much larger payoff up here by eating the cake. So we do tend to go down the pleasure pathway. Humans are creatures of pleasure. And I always say when you're on these paths that you, like you've been on, that you have to associate it with pleasure somehow. And I think that you really found that with running, right? Like that is, became a pleasure for you, became something that you really enjoy doing. And so it works for you. And so it's about finding something that you can associate pleasure with, whether, you know, learn how, learning how to cook good food or finding some sort of sport that you really enjoy doing. I had one woman who got into powerlifting and, and was a really quite a heavy woman. And this was, she just was like, holy, this is my thing. And she just took off on it. And I was like, great, you know, like whatever, whatever floats your boat, that just somehow associate it with pleasure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's something that I really try for. And it's, Frankly, it's a lot easier with my in-person clients that I see at the gym. Uh, I, I always try, I try to make it fun. I try to find a way that it can be enjoyable, hopefully fun, at the very least, not a chore. Because if it becomes a chore, eventually something is going to take precedence over it because this chore is more fun than that chore. And so how do you, what, what does your diet look like now? Because I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, what did you eat? Because people are pretty wrapped up around all different types of diets. And I know you and I have talked about this before, and we have similar viewpoints on it. So can you share with us kind of what your view is on, you know, what's the best diet? Yeah, the best diet is not a diet. I hate, I hate diets. Diet, I hate diets too. <laughs> uh, diet is supposed to mean the food that you eat. It's not mm -hmm. supposed to mean a temporary drastic program for short-term weight loss. It's really, I'm, I feel very strongly about how nutrition should ideally go. You should be making sustainable changes that you can live with for the rest of your life. You should be looking to get all of the, you don't necessarily need a million supplements. You shouldn't be getting all of your food from shakes and bars. If it's a supplement, that's okay. But for a bar or a shake to be a supplement, it has to be supplementing something, you know, that it has to be in addition to most of your day being made up of real food. And that's where all of your nutrition should ideally come from. So I try to eat mostly, you know, lean proteins, chicken breast, leaner cuts of steak, fish, uh, chicken, stuff like that. I try to have veggies. Ideally, most of my carbs will come from veggies because a lot of people don't think about the fact that it's not just cookies and cakes and crackers and chips that are carbs. Veggies are carbs too. Fruit are carbs too. I try to get most of my carbs out of veggies if I can. I don't go crazy on the fruit because it is ultimately sugar, but I'm going to have some fruit. Yeah. I'll, and you know what? I'll be honest. I do have some snacky type of st stuff that I guess would resemble snacks now and then. When I was initially going through my journey, I was a big dude. All I ate was garbage and crap. And if it could be delivered to my dorm or apartment in college, bonus points. And so it, I, you, you can't just go cold turkey from that. It's destined for failure. So I made smaller changes like ditching Diet soda completely was the biggest thing I did. But I also, even then, I was going for the lean sources of protein, healthier meals, healthier recipes, better whole food options. And I would substitute the bad things out, like ice cream and candy bars and stuff like that. I would substitute those out and replace them with 
something that resembled it, but wasn't exactly the same thing. Like instead of a candy bar, I would have a protein bar because while they are a much better option, at the end of the day, a lot of them really are basically candy bars. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a win there. And then you've got frozen yogurt, fat-free frozen yogurt, very low fat frozen yogurt or Greek frozen yogurt instead of straight up ice cream. You know, I, and to this day, I'll still have like some regular old pretzels sometimes, but it's a serving, not the bag. You know, I'll have, I actually really like um, potato chips, the reduced fat ones. I don't know, maybe it's the kettle cooked, whatever, but it's what I really like about those in particular, and I'm sure there are other kettle cooked chips that are like this. They have three ingredients. Yeah. Russet potatoes, canola oil, and salt. I know what's in it. I know what that 130 calories a serving is. And so I have more control over what's going into me. Those kind of things I'm okay with. And I still eat like that today. Like for dinner tonight, we're probably going to end up having drumsticks and a veggie. Uh, we had a big storm last night at Downport and it knocked uh, our, our little... Uh, immature red bell peppers off of the plant before they could actually turn red and get big enough. So we're probably gonna have to do something with those. And we have a big fat eggplant we grew that we gotta do something with too. So we'll probably turn it into eggplant, uh, baked eggplant fries more or less. And you know, bread them with some panko breadcrumbs and some uh, grated Parmesan and bake them. That's probably what dinner's gonna be. Or maybe some really, really lean, like 99% lean turkey burgers. Not Sounds with mayo, good. not with cheese, just on a bun, on, on a, a locale sandwich flat with mustard and ketchup. Yeah. And I think people think that people that are healthy and in the nutrition business like you and I, like we're a hundred percent all the time. Oh God, like, no. And no, and nor should you be. I don't think, I mean, good on you if you can do it. Great. Go for it. But I'm the kind of person it's like, I like my, you know, my, my treats. I have my own little things that I like to eat that, you know, if I'm eating really well, 80% of the time, I kind of feel like that other 20% is for however I choose, really. And it should be that way. You shouldn't have to, you don't have to be 100% in order to successfully lose weight and keep it off. Yeah, it, it really can't be so militant and black and white like that. I, I will say though, and I'm not sure how you feel about this, because I don't think we talked about this when you came on my show. Um, I'm not big on cheat meals, cheat meal, cheat day. I'm not a big yeah, fan. I'm not either. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> if you want to have that stuff, that's fine to a degree, but make it a part of your day. Don't, you know, be good all week and then totally blow it all out on the weekend. You can completely undo a whole week's worth of good nutrition and eating with a day for sure, even one meal. So why are you going to totally blow it out? Like instead of totally going no holds barred in a meal or a day, don't deprive yourself. Have the things that you feel a craving for. Have some version of that thing or allow yourself to have some of the things that you think are kind of bad, but they're not like the devil in food form. And just find a way to work it into your day and, and make it work with how you're trying to eat, how much your macros, however you're breaking it out, make it work. Let yourself have it. Don't deprive yourself. Elimination don't, doesn't work. No, and don't call it a cheat day. I think when you start to categorize it and you and cheating just has this negative connotation to it, and it's like, I'm cheating on my diet. And it's like, no, get rid of that altogether. And it's way better to... I think I'm a little bit different than you are. I, if somebody wants to, you know, hit up the ice cream one night, yeah, go for it. As long as it's not every single night, yeah. you know, then, then that becomes a problem and that's clear. Right. But when you're, like you said, if you have those cravings and it's like, okay, I got to eat something good or not, not, not something good, then you get right back on it tomorrow and make sure that you make up for it the next day with healthy eating habits. Right. It's like, that's okay. That's, there's no problem with that. It's not cheating. You're human, especially women. Our hormones are all over the place, uh, right? And before we, before we menstruate, we get cravings for sugar. And I always say, keep it for that time, you know, like 
when you can be really good, be really good. And then keep it for those times where it's like, okay, now I need some dark chocolate or else I'm going to lose my mind <laughs> and yeah. eat it. Right. <laughs> you, you guys have it rough. Seriously. With the, all the, the hormonal cravings and stuff. It's, I was talking to one of my clients the other day and she was, she like, she came in for a session. We did not have a session. We had a talk and she came in there like verbatim, like I'm having a come to Jesus moment. We need to talk. And she has really been struggling with the nutrition thing because it's really hard and she does really good during the day. And then at night it all goes out the window. And she, once, once that happens, once she has the bad moment, she totally gets down on herself because she doesn't like not being good at stuff. And she totally just beats herself up about it and goes down this terrible little downward spiral and totally blows it out. And you got to understand and remember that if you have a bad moment, if you do something that you think is hurting you or bad, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. This is not a constant upward climb. There's, this is how the fitness journey looks. You're going to have down moments. You just have to acknowledge it learn from the mistake or whatever you're considering it. Maybe you don't consider it a mistake. And the next day, just get back on it. Yes. Yeah, Fail exactly. No. And then if it's a habit, if it's something that you feel you're like your client, if she's finds that she's doing that every single night, then it's like, okay, start looking beyond the food and stop trying to restrict yourself and figure out what's happening that's making, that's driving you then to hit the sugar up every night after dinner. Like, is that time, is that a time, and I do see this a lot, where it's a decompression time. It's like you're, you finally let go and it's your, it's kind of like a reward to yourself. And if people can find some pleasure in their daytime or a time to have a time out during the day, they find that they don't need to eat the sugar at night. Like, you know, like go beyond the food and, and see what else is really going on is, is my take on that too. Oh, definitely. I see that a lot where food mm -hmm. is comfort. It was for me too. And especially with the teachers that I work with, it's like they don't, man, do teachers get abused. Like they just don't have a break. The poor woman doesn't even get an opportunity between classes to run to the bathroom. So she's getting dehydrated because she's not going to pound a liter of water and not be able to go to the bathroom until 3 p.m. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So we can, people can hear more from you because you have an amazing podcast called, uh, so this is fitness. I almost said this is fitness, but it's so this is fitness and you can find him at so this is fitness.com, but it's also the name of the podcast. You can see all his episodes when you go actually onto his site, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. We're going to be putting up episode 98, uh, tonight af after we're done uh, with this video call, I'm going to be getting on finishing the publishing process. And you have a new podcast coming out that is going to have started by the time that this is aired. So tell us a little bit about the new podcast. Yeah, that's actually something me and my wife were working on before I hopped on this call with you. Uh, so we are starting a, uh, a life living lifestyle diary sort of podcast and blog uh, called Living in Stride. It's basically a way for us to connect a little bit better as a couple and, you know, share with our family and friends because we've not been very good about keeping up with all them. And also we, we had the realization, you know, we're both, she's 30, I'm turning 30. We're married millennials trying to figure out life and we're living some of the stereotypes and we're kind of defying others. And we know there's a lot of people out there that are in our shoes that are getting crushed by student loans and it's tough to find a house and what about kids and millennials are killing this that or the other thing this week and so we figured let's invite people in not just share it with our family and friends but invite everybody in and have them share in the you know the struggle and learn from everything that we're going through get mad with us laugh with us cry with us and just kind of experience what life is like Awesome. And that's, what is it called? Life in Stride? Living in Stride. Living in Stride. Oh, I love that name. That's great. Okay. And I'll put all the links in the show notes so you can know where to find it and you can listen to his new podcast. So thank you so much, Daryl, for coming on the show and talking to us and telling us about your story. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.